Thank you, worship team, for leading us so well. And good morning, everyone. Uh, My name is Rod. I'm one of the pastors here at Central Heights Church, and I'm so privileged to be able to stand before you today and bring you God's word. Uh, In the spring, our pastor David asked all of the pastors, would you like to speak? And I don't get this privilege very often, so of course I had to say yes. And then he said, what would you like to speak about? A character from the Bible, and we're in our portrait series. And I thought, well, we don't really hear much about Barnabas. So I thought, well, I'm going to preach about Barnabas. And then I looked to see what he did. I kind of knew about him a little bit, but uh, we're going to dive into God's word today and discover some things that we can learn from Barnabas' life, and uh, we're going to hopefully do that well together. And so I would encourage you throughout this service to actually pull out your Bibles. There's going to be the verses on the screen, but one of the things, that here's a little trick. If I get a little bit boring, you can just read the scriptures around, and then it'll, it'll kind of make your morning even better. So would you do that? Okay. So, we're going to talk about encouragement, of course, because that's what Barnabas is most known for, and uh, he is, after all, referred to as somebody who has a lot of encouragement. So, there's lots of ways to encourage people, of course. Uh, Simply saying, I like what you've done with your hair. Um, I mean, you guys said some works for some. I've never really received that very well. Uh, Or uh, someone could write a note of encouragement and One of the best things you can do nowadays, of course, is text somebody. And you can do it right now, even if you want. Just say, hey, I really appreciate what you've done today. You can encourage people in many different ways. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld, a comedian, wrote us, had a great sitcom. And uh, in one particular episode, he said this. If you want to make a person feel better after they sneeze, you shouldn't say, God bless you. You should say you're so good looking. <laughs> so after to the, in today, maybe not during the service, it would be really funny if someone sneezed right now, wouldn't it? We could all just say you're so good looking, but maybe today you can encourage somebody by after they sneeze, say you're so good looking. That might be fun to do. Uh, you probably have watched the movie The Godfather, and if you haven't, you probably should, and there's a famous line from Don Corleone. I'll make him an offer he can't refuse. I guess that's a way of encouraging in a negative way. So we can encourage in lots of different ways. Uh, As parents, uh, you have to encourage your kids all the time. Uh, You can can do it. Don't do that. Uh, Hurry up. Wait here. Don't touch that. Pick that up. You're so big. Parents, you encourage your kids all the time. There's another great comedian that said this. I don't know what's more exhausting about parenting, the getting up early or the acting like you don't know what you're doing or that you know what you're doing. I read that wrong. As a basketball coach, I used to encourage all the time. I'd be yelling from the sideline, clapping and cheering and realizing later that my players didn't even listen to me most of the time. I was just making a lot of noise and being excited. And we see that now in the Olympics where people or coaches on the sideline are constantly encouraging those on the field of play, and, and there's a, a, an encouragement that happens, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. So you could even, even encourage someone with flowers, apparently. I'm sorry, Amanda, my wife, who doesn't really get that much. We can encourage people in so many ways, but the best encouragement of all, and I'm not sure if she's here this morning, but somebody from our youth group, her name is Natasha Reed, encouraged me once with this. She gave me donuts. Donuts are the pinnacle of encouragement. Wouldn't you agree? Some are nodding, some are going, no, what do you? Okay, so let's talk about Barnabas. Uh, There's actually not much written about Barnabas except his activities associated with Paul. And he doesn't even have any direct quotes in scripture. In fact, the quotes that he has are connected to Paul when they say we blank. Uh, But we're going to explore that a little bit later. Some scholars believe that Barnabas wrote the book of Hebrews. In fact, this goes back to as early as 200 AD by a guy named Tertullian who said this, an apostle to the Hebrews under the name of Barnabas. So we'll have to add that to our list of questions we we get to ask God in heaven. Who wrote the book of Hebrews? We don't know. But it could have been Barnabas. Barnabas was clearly connected to the early church. Uh, He was a Jew 
from the priestly tribe of Levi, and he was even sent out by the church of Jerusalem and of the church of Antioch at some point uh, to do work. So Barnabas was connected, and there's some great examples of him throughout Scripture, and we're going to dive into that a little bit. So now's your time to open up your Bibles, and we're going to look at Acts chapter 4. It says this, all the believers, starting at verse 32, were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no, that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet." So there's a few very interesting things that we learn about Barnabas. First of all, his name is Joseph. Uh, Barnabas was kind of a nickname, and uh, he was, he was uh, singled out as someone who was significant in that story. If you look back in, in that uh, first part of Acts, there's this long description of how the early church came together, and they gave one person as an example of, of selling and giving. There was many people who were selling and giving of their th- possessions and property, but they singled out Barnabas. Why him? Well, it's possible because the apostles really knew him. He was given a nickname after all. He must have been influential, known to them, and important. So it's a great nickname though, isn't it? Son of encouragement. It's a positive one. And it clearly describes who Barnabas was. Now there's some other nicknames that aren't so positive, like say, Stinky Pete or Chatty Cathy, or Doubting Thomas, as we see in Scripture. And somehow we've twisted that name of Barnabas a little bit. I can picture a scene in an office where a co-worker says, oh, way to go, you really did it this time, and the other co-worker says, thanks a lot, Barnabas, or thanks a lot, Mr. Encouragement. We come sometimes say it in a negative way, but let's not mix up this nickname. The son of encouragement is something and some attribute that we should all aspire to. He was also a Levite. So what does that mean in our, in, in our context? We have to go back to 1 Chronicles to read about who the Levites were. The duty of the Levites was to help Aaron's descendants in the service of the temple of the Lord, to be in charge of the courtyards, the side rooms, the purification of all sacred things, and the performance of other duties at the house of God. Levites were of great importance to the people of Israel at that time. And what's really interesting is something modern readers uh, would just skim over. He was a Levite from Cyprus. Did you catch it? From Cyprus. Cyprus is an island in the Mediterranean. So he wasn't from where the traditional Levites would have been. What was he doing on Cyprus? There's some speculation that that's maybe where his wife was from. Or maybe he just liked island life. It's like our friends from Vancouver Island. We just don't know why they live there, but they choose to live there, and we just don't understand. Barnabas liked the island. The Levites were a priestly tribe, were under many restrictions, and bound to many duties. Numbers 18 describes some of them. The Lord said to Aaron, "Will you, you will have no inheritance in their land, nor will you have any share among them. I am your share and your inheritance among the Israelites. So did Barnabas really own property? Well, there's, some, there's several possibilities. First, uh, the restriction that had maybe long been abandoned since Barnabas' time arrived on the scene. And even Jeremiah was told to, by God, to buy land. Second, maybe Barnabas may never have served as a Levite other than a mention of Barnabas the Levite, Luke doesn't elaborate any more in the book of Acts about his genealogy or lineage or acts that he did. Third, it's quite possible that the restriction only applied to land in Israel. Well, he's from Cyprus, so maybe it didn't apply at that time. And 
Maybe it was his wife's land. Fourth, and this is probably the more realistic one, in Deuteronomy 18, it talks about the sale of family possessions and evidence that Levites actually held property privately. And it says this in a quote, whatever the explanation, Barnabas certainly followed the example of the Levites. Levites were servants. They took care of the temple grounds and gates, provided music at various sacrifices and ceremonies, and performed other important tasks. The servanthood of Barnabas, the son of consolation or encouragement, is seen in his willingness to sell his land and lay the proceeds at the feet of the apostles. Apostles. What can we learn from Barnabas? Encouragement is giving. Not only did Barnabas give of his personal resources, which would have been a, come at great sacrifice. I mean, that's the family inheritance that he gave to the early church. Let's look at what he did in a personal way. It started with taking care of his enemy, Saul. Saul, the one who persecuted the first followers of Jesus, whom we know better as Paul now, the one who wrote most of the New Testament, but just after Saul converted to Christianity, was trying to connect with the disciples. Paul was, or Saul at that time, was trying to, to get in with the disciples, and it says this in chapter nine of Acts. When he came to Jerusalem, this is, this is Saul, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. Well, no kidding. Not believing that he really was a disciple, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. No direct quotes are listed as to what Barnabas would have said or or he just recounted that, yeah, this guy, he's talking about the Lord. Could you imagine how that conversation would have gone? Uh, So guys, um, you know that guy who is uh, killing some of our friends? Well, he wants to be our friend now. Um, I think that's okay. I don't think he's gonna murder us this time. Uh, We should invite him in. Could you imagine how that would have gone? Like Barnabas gave him a chance. Now this was obviously divine inspiration from God to Barnabas and uh, it just, but it revealed how Barnabas simply looked for the best in Saul. He saw something there, and he, you know, kind of put his neck on the line to invite him into their circle. Years ago, when we were living in Chilliwack, um, we lived in a pretty nice new neighborhood. In fact, we built our house, and we got to see all the houses build up around us. We lived in Promontory. If you know that area, you've seen the growth that has happened there. And so we're up at the top of the hill, and we're seeing houses being built all around us, and this really nice house gets built across the street from us. And then, of course, people move in. And I find out that these people uh, are Chinese. And I found out just through uh, you know, showing, them, showing me where they lived on a map that they spoke Mandarin. So I was, con- I was determined. I wanted to get to know them. I wanted to be an example in my community and an example in my neighborhood of, of Jesus to them. And so in Chilliwack, there was a Chinese-speaking church. And so I went to them and I said, can I have some of your Bibles and maybe some of your Mandarin gospel tracts? Of course, they gave them to me. And I walked up to the door across the street. And I don't know what, I'm pretty intimidating, I guess, when I go to a door. I don't know why. So I, you know, I stood on the lower step and I reached up and I knocked the door and I kind of made sure I wasn't, you know, going to break in. And uh, I presented them the, the Bible and gospel tracts, and I thought, well, I'm gonna have this great relationship now, an opportunity to evangelize in my own neighborhood, it's great, and I kind of looked in, and they didn't have anything in their house. And as time went on, I I noticed they never opened their blinds, and and I didn't see any furniture trucks or any of them moving anything into their house. Um, But we did notice some vans pulling into the driveway and pulling into the garage and closing and opening and leaving. And then our dog would sniff at their house at different times, and. And I would continue to cut their grass and try to connect with them. And then one day, we're having a garage sale, and police roll in. And we thought, oh no, did we not get a permit? Or we didn't need the one, of course. And they went across the street and pulled out garbage bags. 
And we realized that this grow up was busted right across the street from us. I just hope they read the Bible. <laughs> but I was pretty naive. My wife, who has the gift of discernment, the whole time was like, there's something going on there. I'm like, oh, no, it's fine. I'm going to preach the gospel to them. Uh, yeah, it wasn't fine. And they kind of wrecked that house. But uh, I tried to see the best in them. I tried to invite them in. That's kind of what Barnabas did to Saul. And he invited Saul in. He saw the best in him. Uh, the di- disciples of obviously were suspicious and, and Barnabas simply cared enough about what the Lord had done in Saul's life to stand up for them. Encouragement is caring. Encouragement is caring. Just, to, just imagine what Saul would have experienced. Uh, he was radically changed. Uh, his perspective on life was, was transformed. His perspective on, on what he was doing was, was radically altered. And then one guy stands up for him. And not only was that person respected enough by the, by the others, he cared enough to potentially put his life, reputation, and status on the line for, and cared for him. That was Barnabas. Has anyone done that for you? Think in your mind as you, as you just process that. Has anyone stood up for you and cared for you in that way? You've probably all got stories in your head just rolling around about how somebody had taken care of you or, or, or looked out for you in a certain way. And I would hope that you could also tell stories in your mind's eye about times in which you've been that to others in caring for others. Caring is encouragement. Let's look ahead in a few chapters in Acts chapter 11. So flip ahead, Acts chapter 11, starting at verse 19. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed, well, and Saul was the one presiding over that, remember, they, they traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was on them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Now let's get a little bit Bible geography nerdy, would you? Okay, so here's the trick. This is the Mediterranean. If you hold up your right hand in front of you, you don't have to do it high, you can just do it down low so nobody will notice. But just do this and you can, this is the Mediterranean. And at where your right knuckle is, that's Antioch. Okay, it's kind of the north part of the Mediterranean, the northeast. So these are some distances they traveled. By the way, Cyprus, an island in the middle of the Mediterranean um, was not that close. And I love maps, especially because I get lost all the time. In fact, even to go home, I've lived in the same house for about seven years now. I still punch in the GPS how to get home, and I'm in Vancouver. I, I don't know, I just, I, just, I just do. And recently I took a, a book out of the library called British Columbia, A New Historical Atlas. It's this big, huge coffee table book. It was awesome. I read through the history of, of, the B, of BC through maps. And so you can tell I'm a bit of a map nerd. So maps are great. So when I hear about places in the Bible, I'm always curious about where they are. So we often read through these places. And I just read a passage. I listed off a bunch of names. And to us, it's like, oh, they, 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 and, we, and we just travel so quick. We're so used to just thinking that we can instantly transport to place, to place after place without grasping the location, the significance, where these places are. So Cyprus is, a Mediterranean, is an island in the Mediterranean, as, as I said a number of times. Did you know that it's about 200 kilometers away from Antioch? Cyrene is in North Africa, about 2,000 kilometers from Antioch. They were sailing, too. So if you've ever been on a sailboat, you know you never can go in a straight line. You're always at the, at the will of the wind, and rarely going straight. So these numbers could have been doubled as far as their travel distance went. And of course, all by foot, or maybe by donkey. For perspective, Horseshoe Bay to Departure Bay is 60 kilometers. And we think that's a long trip. I don't know if any of you are just gonna go to 
to Vancouver Island just for fun this afternoon and come home? Maybe? No. Yeah, no one's putting their hand up. I mean, these are long distances, and we take for granted the amount of travel that happened in, in the Bible. So, eventually, back to the story, eventually the news gets to the church in Jerusalem. So if you pull out your map of the Mediterranean, Jerusalem's kind of down here, inland a bit. Uh, news gets to Jerusalem from Antioch, and who do they send? They send Barnabas. Going there would be like traveling to Edmonton, by the way. That's kind of the distance we're talking. And he did it by foot or maybe by boat. Again, by boat, take a longer because it's not a straight line. Encouragement is going. See, Barnabas could have said no. He could have said, no, I don't want to go up there. That's too long of a trip. I'm, my feet are sore. I just can't do it. No, he went. Encouragement is going. And I think we really take it for granted, the, the personal commitment that it would have taken in biblical times to travel. And we just read through the stories like, oh, they just went here and there, like they were tel- teleporters back then. Just imagine what that would be like. So back to Acts chapter 11. When they arrived, when he arrived, so this is talking about Barnabas, when he arrived, he saw that the grace of God, what the grace of God had done. He was glad and, enc- and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. We get a deeper look into what Barnabas' character was like in these verses. He was a good man full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith, and he brought people to the Lord. These are great things. In his going, he was able to demonstrate and model his character. And then he just goes to find Saul in Tarsus. By the way, uh, that's a couple hundred miles, kilometers away. It wasn't like he just went next door to his neighbor's house and picked, hey, come over here. No, he had to travel hundreds of kilometers to find Saul. That must have been quite a time for that whole year. I also love in these verses how we hear the, the, the origin of the name Christian. This, this is a pretty pivotal story. And let me share with you another example of Barnabas going. This is in Acts chapter 13. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Notice the list of the order here. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and if you just kind of look a little bit higher in your Bible, you can see what happened to Herod just previously, so that's an interesting name drop. Take it, take it and study it later. And Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. It was after this that Paul, Barnabas and Saul began to travel on their missionary journeys. And as you can see in Acts 13, something very interesting happens in this chapter. As they were visiting Barnabas' home island of Cyprus, Saul is now referred to as Paul in verse 9. As he enters more of a Gentile ministry, he changes his name in this very chapter on Barnabas' home island. That's, I find that fascinating. And the order in which their names are listed changes after this. Barnabas and Saul are now referred to as Paul and Barnabas. It's subtle, but it speaks to how they were perceived as a ministry team. It speaks to their characters and, their, and how they acted together. It also speaks to Barnabas' true nature as encouragement is humbling. There's a moment later in Acts when they're referred to as Barnabas and Paul, so if you look ahead, you can see their, their names get interchanged a little bit further on, so it's not always Paul and Barnabas, but in Acts 15, it was when they were before the Jerusalem council, the council in which sent Barnabas originally, so Barnabas probably was the head guy there. But Paul received the top billing in most of the rest of the scripture. It means that he was the principal actor, the influencer, 
the influential person, the headliner, the main character. It also speaks of who Barnabas was, that it was okay to be the assistant, the backup, the alternate. Barnabas humbled himself. There's a great illustration of this in Acts 13, starting at verse 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Now let me paint a picture of what's happening here. They had a great time the week before. The, Paul preached an amazing sermon, and you can kind of skim and look back at it, and they, it was so good that they invited him back another time. So I know that this isn't gonna happen, but I, I probably won't be speaking next week, but anyway, that's what happened there. They did such a great job that they were invited back for another time. And now they're not in Antioch, it's Pisidian Antioch, it's a different town. It just kind of carries the same name. And we've got lots of names like that around our country and around the world where there's similar names like London and London, London, Ontario, London, England. Like, so we've got similar names. So Pisidian Antioch is a town they think is about 20,000 people. And it says here, almost the whole city gathered. Could you imagine that crowd? Again, we skim over these things and don't realize the significance of this. This is a big event. They're asked to come back and speak and the whole, the, whole, the whole city shows up. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. Now this paints a very clear picture of what is so common in society today, isn't it? Jealousy. And then throwing stones at the other person. So we see it in beefs like Kendrick and, Lamar, and, Kendrick and Drake. Uh, ask a young adult what that means, I have no idea. Uh, Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese. Ask a basketball fan about that. Uh, left-wing politics, right-wing politics. We're gonna watch the USA go through this, like, and we have already. I could go on and on about different groups battling with each other. And this is what's happening in this city where the Jews were riling up the people who had just heard the gospel, and in fact, remember, they invited him to come speak again, it was so good. But there was jealousy that happened. So back into verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, we had to speak the word of God to you first, since you rejected it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life. We now turn to the Gentiles. So they spoke directly to the Jews, who were raising up trouble, and they turned and spoke to the Gentiles. Now, I don't know all of our histories, all of our family trees. There might be some people here of Jewish descent, but I would guess that most of us here are Gentiles. If this didn't happen, we wouldn't be here today. This is amazing. This is what it says in verse 47. For this is what the Lord had commanded us. I have made you a light to the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord. And all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region. But the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and they expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. What an amazing event, full of hope in eternal life, contrasted by persecution and get out of my town. And I love the end though. The disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. In spite of all that was going on, they still were able to have joy. In verse 46, even though we language is used, Paul was the original person they were contradicting. As their spokesperson, and Barnabas in humility was there to support. Paul and Barnabas were kicked out. And after experiencing amazing opportunities and sharing their faith, that that must have been very disappointing. They were, in fact, This is the second time they came back, an encore performance, and they get kicked out afterwards. It must have been a blow to their pride. But as we see at the end of Acts 13, the filling of the Holy Spirit corrects their disposition and removes pride and replaces it with joy. Might I suggest that the antidote to selfish pride in our lives is the Holy Spirit? 
I recently saw this meme, this picture of a medieval knight, and he was dressed uh, head to toe in armor, just looked solid, impenetrable, impressive. And uh, in the picture, though, was this arrow that went through his eye port. And I would suggest that that armor is pride. We've, you know, we often feel like you know, we can do it all, but a little chink in that armor pierced him in humility. Paul and Barnabas traveled through the whole region preaching the gospel. And then in Acts 14, there's another story where Barnabas has to model humility. In Acts 14, verse eight. In Lystra, there was a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith in the, and he, to be healed, and called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw that Paul, what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. Could you imagine what that would have been like, the scene there? Could you imagine what it'd be like to be worshiped as a god? What would you do? Uh, I can't help but think some of us might have manipulated that crowd a little bit. Like, yeah, bring me some, bring me some grapes. Uh, give me a comfortable seat. I can't think, you know, it kind of reminds me of when C-3PO uh, met the Ewoks for the first time. Star Wars nerds can go, yeah, I remember that. I can't help but think what Paul and Barnabas would have thought, but here's what they did do in verse 14. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews from Antioch and Iconium, or came from Antioch and Iconium, and won the crowd over. Just imagine the scene. These guys were being worshipped as gods in one moment. The Jews from these other regions that actually kicked them out came down and influenced the crowd and won them over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Bert Derby. <laughs> wow. I know Barnabas wasn't killed in this situation, but could you imagine what it'd be like to see your friend killed, stoned in front of you, dragged out of the city, left for dead? And then the joy that would have happened, he gets up and he walks and goes back into that same city. Just imagine that. That would have been very humbling. And it would have created a, a very humbling situation where they were actually preaching the good news, the gospel, they were seeing lives transformed. We hear this, this great story, but yet they're told to just keep moving on. Moving on, moving on. Humility sometimes takes the form of doing what's best for the cause. And we have a clear example of this in Acts 15. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord to see what they are doing. <laughs> yeah, all those towns that were there trying to kill us, let's go back there. Barnabas wanted, wanted to, take, to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. Mark, by the way, is... Barnabas is relative. You can see that in Colossians chapter four. And later on, Paul actually mended his relationship with Mark and 
in the closing of Colossians, he greets him. So you know that there was conflict for sure, but it was mended. In Galatians 2, it reveals that there is perhaps more to this story as Paul associates Barnabas with his dispute with Peter, but that's a whole other sermon. We won't get into that today. Barnabas is no longer mentioned in Acts, but Paul, in fact, uses Barnabas as an illustration in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 when he wrote to them. And as we read this, let's answer the questions together. Now, you don't have to say it out loud. If you want to, you can. If you need to wake up at this point in the sermon, you can. You can speak out loud. I'm going to ask a few questions. They're rhetorical in nature, but let's, let's read this. Am I not free? Yes. Am I not an apostle? This is Paul speaking. Yes. Have I not seen Jesus as Lord? Yes. Are you not a result of my work in the Lord? Yes. Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Yes. Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us? Or as, the, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Yes. Or is it only I and Barnabas who lack the right to not work for a living? No. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? No one. Who plants a, plants a vineyard and does not eat its grapes? No one. Who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? No one. Do I say this merely on human authority? No. Does it, doesn't the law say the same thing? Yes. I enjoy these kinds of rhetorical questions in scripture. It makes us think a little bit. Quite often we just read through this and we don't really process this. And I want you to notice in verse six, which is the, the turning point in this passage, it says something about Barnabas, that he encourages others through his humility in working hard with little expectation of compensation. Both Paul and Barnabas are the primary examples of missionaries who relied on others for financial support. Did you know that our church supports 40 missionaries financially and through relationship with partnerships? We have a church in, in Guadalajara that we partner with. It's called La Quintera. You've heard of it a little bit. We have relationship with them and we really want to send a group down there and, and encourage them. We have other partners throughout our community in which we partner with. All told, this partnership has a dollar value of about $200,000 every year. You are a generous church supporting lots of work that's going on as missionaries are humbling themselves and going into the missions field. And there's some missionaries even in our midst this morning who are, who are living this out. It's humbling asking for that kind of support. So let's continue to support them. Let's continue to give. Let's continue to do this work. Verse nine is one of my favorite verses in, in 1 Corinthians chapter nine. It talks about human resources, which is part of my world. Uh, it talks about the workplace, paying uh, payroll, uh, and it's how to treat staff. It says this, for it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because whoever plows and threshes should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. Pay the workers. In a way, Barnabas embodied the work of an ox. He gave of himself, caring for people. He was feeding spiritually, going the extra mile. You can just picture that ox treading the grain, going and going and going, and humbling himself in service. See, I've been so blessed in my life to be encouraged by so many different people. It started at a young age. My parents brought me to church, and I remember sitting in pretty close to the front row because I probably was misbehaving in the back row. And, uh, and so they made me sit down here. I really wanted to be back there. And one, one service, I put my hand up because I wanted to become a Christian so bad. And I did. And pastor was looking over my head, so I stood up. I was, I was little once. And I remember my mom pulling on my pants, sit down, Rodney, because that's my real name, and sit down, Rodney, and, and so I did, but I, I became a Christian that day because I was encouraged by those around me to come to church. And later on, I became baptized, and 
I had the privilege of serving at kids camps uh, and actually attending kids camps growing up and I actually met my wife at camp. We are, we're paying attention to the kids. We noticed each other for sure. And, uh, and then I got to go to Bible school and learn and grow in that way and discover what I should do with my life. There's so many people in my life that have encouraged me. And you can think about those people in your life with, that, that, have, that have encouraged you in your journey. Don't forget them. But also, at this point in your life, you should be the one also encouraging others, being that light to those people around you, to encourage them in their faith, to be a blessing. I wanna read uh, a, from the book of Hebrews, which we're not saying this is written by Barnabas, but I would kinda like to think it might be. And we're gonna read this and close. It's not gonna be on the screen. So just let it absorb, fall over you. It says this. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on to love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Are you gonna be like Barnabas? Barnabas?